start trickling in and do a brief introduction as we uh, wait on the room to fill up. I uh, just want to welcome everybody to today's session. Uh, it's a Wayne Law Information Session. Uh, we're taking this opportunity to tell you all a little bit more about us as an institution, uh, hopefully give you some information that maybe you didn't have and teach you some things that maybe you didn't know uh, about us as you uh, consider Wayne Law uh, as your law school of the future. Of course, my name is Justin Williams. I am the Associate Director of Admissions uh, and Diversity Recruitment here at Wayne Law. I've been here since January of 2019. I am a graduate of Michigan State University College of Law circa 2015. I've uh, done a lot of different things in my career, but I uh, feel well positioned to help you all better understand how Wayne can be uh, the school that propels you to the best version of yourself. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, why Wayne Law, right? Why choose us at all? What makes us special and unique? Uh, I think a big piece of that puzzle is the value proposition, right? Uh, so you're getting an outstanding education at a, at a pretty good cost, right, as far as law schools go. Uh, as you see the cost there for the 2020-2021 academic year is roughly 33000 about the same as it was last year. We didn't do an increase, uh, so that's definitely a plus. Uh, and then the scholarship piece, I mean, we give out a lot of money, right, as a part of this process for well-positioned uh, and well-heeled applicants. They can expect to receive a pretty strong scholarship offer as a part of that package. Uh, we've been ranked the best value law school for several years in a row. Uh, we're ranked number 83 overall, right, in those U.S. News and World Report rankings, if that's something that tickles your fancy. Uh, one of the numbers that I am most proud of uh, is that we are number 22 uh, for law schools in the country with the lowest debt to starting income ratio. Uh, that's courtesy of our good friends over at Spivey Consulting using some data uh, from law school transparency. But what that means is uh, when you compare the amount of debt that you will incur uh, to the cost of, or, or really what you can expect to pay as your first job starting salary, uh, we, we fare better than most of the schools out there. So uh, all things considered, right, I think we're a great value proposition and a really good opportunity for you to get a great education uh, at a cost that's reasonable and won't be burdensome to you uh, post-graduation. Uh, so the other piece too is that you know, we try to provide people with some good choices. You see Morpheus there with the red and the blue pill. I might be aging myself with the Matrix reference. A new movie's coming soon, but I thought it was appropriate here. Uh, you get to choose your own path, right? Uh, to the extent that you can do that in the law school space. Uh, so we're talking about flexibility in your degree path and how you get there. Uh, so you can go full time, right? As a daytime student, the traditional three year path full-time student approach. Uh, you can also go part-time in the evening. So I'm sure that some of you in this room uh, are working professionals, right, who are considering this as uh, a little bit longer of a journey, right? Maybe you're saying to yourself, I can do this in four, four and a half years if I do it in the evening and I can still maintain my job and pay my bills. Now, the part-time evening program is probably a good fit and a good consideration for you. Uh, it gives you the opportunity, again, to uh, still be a working person and, and uh, go about the business of uh, acquiring your JD. Now, there's also a combined day evening program, right? So maybe you work in a space uh, that gives you a little bit more flexibility, right? Uh, and so, you know, you want to take a class or two during the day and a couple of classes in the evening uh, and position yourself to get that degree. Now, you've got that flexibility. Uh, as far as uh, the number of options for pursuit of your degree, uh, I think we've got the broadest slate in the state. In fact, I'm fairly confident we're the only uh, true part-time evening program uh, in the state. So if you're thinking about going to law school this way, uh, we are without a doubt your best bet. Now, there are also dual degree options for those of you who are thinking about uh, extending your academic career a bit and getting two degrees uh, in one fell swoop. You can pursue uh, the dual degree options that we have in criminal justice, business, dispute resolution, economics, history, and poli sci. Now, those degrees are master's degrees, right? So it's not a JD PhD program, it's JD and a master's degree. Uh, but the benefit here is that you get those two degrees in four years. So uh, when you're thinking about, you know, getting those two degrees separately, it's probably five years for most people. Uh, and our students generally finish in four or four and a half years. It just depends on how you uh, balance the coursework. But the real magic is in the fact that you've got roughly four courses that you'll take that'll satisfy credits in both programs. And so that's where you really get uh, the benefit of doing these, both of these programs at once. Uh, and you get that opportunity again to have 
uh, two new degrees uh, out of the process as opposed to that one. Uh, so beyond the classroom, right, I think students are thinking more and more about ways that they can take their learning in the classroom space and apply it to uh, the real world in some practical ways. Uh, and I like to think at Wayne that we're pretty good at that, right? Uh, so from the practical training standpoint, we've got a strong clinical program. Uh, as uh, you'll see in that practical training space, we've got a clinic in asylum and immigration law, business and community law clinic, uh, appealing post-conviction advocacy, a disability law clinic, a legal advocacy for people with cancer clinic. And what they provide you know, is an opportunity for you to take that theory into practice, right? So if you're somebody who's interested in corporate or business law and you want to figure out ways that you can get into that space before you graduate uh, and really use your powers for good, right? To help people uh, who maybe uh, need that support in ways that you know, larger corporate clients may not, and a business and community law clinic may make some sense for you. Or if uh, you're interested in helping uh, people figure out how to advocate for their rights uh, when they're in populations that are affected differently, right? So disability law or a legal advocacy for people with cancer clinics are great fits for you. And for those of you who are interested in immigration law, I'll talk to a lot of students who are thinking about that. Uh, it's a hot button topic right now. I think that people are interested in it in a lot of different ways. Uh, that asylum, asylum and immigration law clinic could be a great fit for you, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you can take what you're learning from the classroom uh, and use it in our clinical setting uh, to really round out your skill set and build out uh, a career for yourself and start to figure out what you want to do professionally once you're done. Uh, I think the other piece of this too is the externship space, right? So externships are also a big piece of, of what students may do uh, in the law school space to build out some practical experience. Uh, I think that, you know, one of the sort of the tent poles in that space for us is the corporate counsel externship program. It's such a unique program in that uh, you'll actually get the opportunity through this uh, program to be placed uh, in the office of a corporation, right? Uh, and function in their corporate counsel uh, office as an attorney, right? So you'll be working with uh, licensed attorneys working under the supervision of those attorneys. Uh, and there'll be a classroom component where you'll bring the things that you're doing practically into the back into the academic space and talk about those and really figure out and sort out what the work that you're doing means. Uh, and I think it's just a unique opportunity. Uh, and it sort of fits into that business and community law clinic space for those folks who are interested in corporate law, who are interested in business law, uh, to really build out some practical experience while they are students uh, to do this beyond what you do in the summer, right? So, you know, for those of you who aren't uh, as well versed, right, or uninitiated, most law students are doing the work that lawyers do in the summer, and that's where they get some of their experience. Uh, but these externships and, and, and clinical programs provide another opportunity uh, for you to continue to round out and shape those skills. Uh, we also have, of course, the sort of traditional judicial externships, right? Uh, public service externships and uh, a new arrow in our quiver, you know, sort of a second level, right? Public service externship that's focused on social justice lawyering, right? So the placements will really speak to that specifically uh, and allow students who are uh, interested in that work and in that space uh, to seek out public service opportunities uh, that align with their values and the work that they want to do as attorneys. So. Uh, that sort of, in a nutshell, right, covers some of our externship and practical training spaces. I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, FLAC, right, or the Free Legal Aid Clinic. Uh, it's a really unique opportunity in that uh, it's technically a student-run 501c nonprofit, right? So it's separate from our other clinics. It's its own thing. Uh, it's a legal aid organization that was established by an intrepid group of Wayne Law students in 1965. Uh, the work uh, sort of fits under the bubble of uh, elder law and family law. So the, the cases that come through there uh, that you may be assigned to work as an, as an attorney are going to fit into that. And, and you are functioning as an attorney, right? You're working under uh, the license of a supervising attorney, right? Uh, but you'll be doing the work that lawyers do. You'll have your own caseloads, your own problems for people that you're trying to solve. Uh, and it's a really good way, again, to build out that experience and build a reputation uh, and a portfolio of work, right, so that you can show people, hey, I can do the things that lawyers do because I did those things while I was a law student. So uh, just think about all of those things when you're thinking about why Wayne might be a good fit for you. Again, that practical training beyond the classroom. 
And there's also that co-curricular piece, right? So if you're thinking about all of the traditional stuff that's offered in the law school space, uh, outside the classroom enrichment sort of things, uh, we carry a lot of those same things, right? We've got a moot court team, mock trial, a transactional law competition, even uh, the Jessup International Law Moot Court Program. Uh, it's a really great program at Wayne. They typically place well in competitions uh, and demonstrate and, and acquit themselves well in that space. So if you think about international law, I think the, the Jessup International Law Moot Court team uh, is going to ring some bells for you. Uh, so that's definitely a thing for you to think about. Uh, there's also the, the journal program, right? Like all law schools, we've got our own journal program, uh, which includes the Wayne Law Review, the Journal of Law in Society, and then also the Journal of Business Law, right? So that's, a, uh, again, another wonderful thing that you can access and be a part of as a part of the Wayne Law community. Uh, but let's get down to brass tacks, right? The word of the day is J-O-B, right? We, we want to talk about outcomes and careers. What happens when people go to come to our law school and graduate? Do they get jobs? Uh, and the answer to that is largely yes, right? And all of this information is available on our website uh, in the ABA standard 509 disclosures, right? So there's some consumer data. If you scroll down to the bottom of our website, lower right-hand corner, you'll see an ABA logo. Uh, you click that, it'll bring you to a series of reports, right? That capture all of the data that, that now you should be thinking about, right, when you're considering a review in a law school. Uh, so for the most recent year, 2019, that we've got the data, uh, 133 graduates, 114 of them uh, got the kinds of jobs that you would feel the best about, right? So those bar passage required or JD Advantage jobs, students got those jobs. I think, I think the thing that uh, is the most interesting is that we only had roughly 11 students unemployed, right? And uh, those students are unemployed and seeking, right? And so we're working really hard with those students to continue to get them jobs and get them the kinds of opportunities that they want. Uh, but on the whole, right, if you graduate and get your bar card, you'll get the kind of job that you want. Uh, 94 of those 114 jobs were bar passage required. The other 20 were something that we qualify as JD Advantage, right? So what that means is it's the kind of job where having a JD uh, will set you apart in the marketplace and can be an asset to you in the management of the work. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to have a license to do it, right? So that could be anything, you know, compliance or in some roles in business, right? Uh, we're having a JD and this skill set could be an advantage to you. And I think that's also a plus and that not everybody's going to use this degree of practice in the traditional sense. Uh, so if you're thinking about going to law school because you want the skill set, right? And you're wondering if there are opportunities out there, they absolutely exist. Uh, and we absolutely have the, the oomph uh, with our career and professional development office uh, to connect you to those opportunities uh, and put you in a place where you can set those goals and achieve them. Uh, so the other piece of the puzzle, right, Detroit 2, uh, I think is a big, big draw here. Uh, so I say Detroit 2 because when I think about all of the other cities that people want to be in uh, to practice law or live, I, and they say, well, you know, does the, you know, what about New York? I say, well, Detroit 2, right? Well, we've got Fortune 500 companies, Detroit too, right? Who's got top law firms? All of those, you know, Chicago, New York, uh, Los Angeles, Detroit too, right? We've got the nonprofits, Detroit too, government agencies, right? Uh, and our law school is located right in the heart of all of that. And that's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful opportunity, right? You know, for our students to be able to walk out of our doors and, you know, go five minutes in one direction, right? And they're at the you know, a federal courthouse five minutes in the other direction, right? And you're at, you know, one of the largest corporations in the country, right? You know, that just had its uh, first public uh, offering, right? Quicken Loans, right? I mean, there's just so much happening, you know, in and around the city and so many opportunities that come out of that. Uh, our location is a big draw, right? So when you think about the other places that you may be considering to practice law, just know that whatever that place has, Detroit does too. Uh, let's take a step back here and really talk about the application process because I'm sure there's some questions out there about that. Uh, and I want to make sure I cover the bases as broadly as I can. And then in our Q&A session, you know, maybe touch on some specifics for people who have questions around it. So uh, what are we looking for, right? What's this about? When we open up an application, what are we looking for? What are we trying to sort of suss out, right, for somebody who's uh, applying to Wayne Law? Now, I think the big question is, First, 
how confident are we that you can succeed in our building academically and are in a position uh, to come in and, and thrive, right, in our academic environment uh, with the kinds of students that you'll be in a classroom with. Uh, and we get there, uh, we make that assessment uh, using three sort of key pieces of your application. Uh, that is your performance on the LSAT, right? And so what that does is it, it tests your ability at like how you think, how you solve problems, right? How you display these skills uh, that are pretty endemic to the law school experience uh, as weighed against your peers, right? So in, in long story short, it's like a potential measure, right? It, you've got these skills, right? How do you re relate to your peers in this particular set of skills? Uh, and then also your, your grade point average, right? And so it's the number that matters, right? But it's also the big picture, right? What have you produced in a classroom setting right, where you're being asked to be a student, right? What do we know about your track record of being a student? Uh, but also what trends do we see in your performance, right? Uh, so what are the things that we notice about how you performed over time, right? Were there ebbs and flows? Were you pr pretty consistently a rock star? Did you start out maybe with some challenges and improve over time? So we're looking at what that GPA says, right? But also what it tells us uh, about who you are as a student and, uh, you know, sort of how you navigated the academic journey to this point. Uh, and then to a lesser extent, letters of recommendation can fit into that narrative, right? So if you are a recent grad from college, I would say two years or less, uh, when you're thinking about letters of recommendation, if you're applying to Wayne, at least one of those needs to come from somebody who's taught you in a classroom. Uh, and that's something when we're reading those letters, what we wanna know is who are you as a student? How do you show up? What do you bring to the table? Are you prepared, right? So what's the story of you as a student through the eyes of a professor or faculty member who has taught you? I think the second big question is more the soft skills, right? So uh, for those of you who will be joining us next week for the personal statement uh, workshop, right? We'll talk a little bit more about the personal statement in detail, uh, but this is where that piece of the puzzle sort of comes in. And what we're trying to figure out uh, is what's the value add for having you in our class, right? What do you bring to the table beyond that academic acumen that's gonna be essential to this class and makes you unique in your own special way? Uh, and again, we get to that through your personal statement, uh, through your resume, through your letters of recommendation, right, to a lesser extent, uh, and then any sort of contextual addendum that you might provide to us that helps us better understand the thing that might be a question mark in the process. So, you know, when I'm talking about addendums uh, and addenda, right, I think that what we're thinking about is one, you know, there's a, most, there's a question in the application about character and fitness. Uh, so if you answer in the affirmative to those character and fitness questions, then you're going to provide an addendum that uh, lays out sort of what happened, right, what that situation was, where things stand presently, uh, any details that you feel like are important for us to know about uh, whatever caused you to answer in the affirmative, right, on that, uh, that character and fitness question. Uh, there's also a strain of addendum that addresses uh, things in the application that may cause a committee to go, hmm, so let's say theoretically uh, you've got a really strong GPA, but maybe your LSAT score uh, isn't up to par, right? Uh, students sometimes like to submit an addendum that helps us better understand, right, why uh, that is the case, right? Maybe you aren't a, a strong test taker and you've got a history of outperforming uh, your performance on standardized tests, by your production in the classroom. So students will tell that story through an addendum. Or maybe, right, on the opposite side of that coin, uh, you're somebody who uh, performed really well on the LSAT, and maybe you weren't as great uh, in the classroom. And there's a story behind that. And the story that you're trying to tell is that, hey, these things were impacting me, or this was the story around my academics, but this, uh, this LSAT score is a stronger indicator of what I can do and how I show up in the classroom. Uh, the resume piece is always interesting because I think that, uh, you know, sometimes people are wondering how much resume is enough and how much is not enough, right? Uh, and I think generally, right, for most people, uh, I would say that two pages of resume is enough for this process. Uh, but if you're a seasoned professional who's had a long and storied career and has done a lot of things, don't feel an obligation to truncate that resume, right? Submit to us uh, your most recent resume. 
Uh, we will review it in kind and treat it with the same kind of due respect and care that we do every other resume in the process. Um, if you've got a one page resume, just because you're a recent grad, that's absolutely fine. Uh, don't feel obligated to uh, sort of embellish the resume and try to find things to add to it, right? Whatever your resume looks like now, so long as it's well written and a strong representation of the things that you've accomplished and prioritized outside the classroom space, is probably a good resume. Uh, and then the last piece of this puzzle is less about you all and more about us as an institution, right? Uh, so in every cycle, uh, you are up against the enrollment goals that we establish for ourselves as an institution uh, and the applicant pool itself. Uh, I know this question is going to come, so I'm going to try to answer it now. Uh, next year's class, in terms of uh, median LSAT and GPA, uh, the median GPA target, I believe, is a 3.65, uh, and the median LSAT target is a 160. And so that means that uh, the closer you are to those numbers, uh, the better your chances and the, and the likelier that your profile aligns with some of our enrollment goals, right? Uh, so be thinking about that as you're trying to assess, right, your chances of being admitted straight away. Now, the stronger your academic profile is, uh, I think the better your chances, right? So be thinking about that, uh, be thoughtful about that in the process. Uh, you're also weighed against the applicant pool itself, right? So how does your application fare against your peers? How do you fit into that puzzle as well? So uh, in a nutshell, right, those are the things that uh, we are looking for when we review applications uh, and consider applicants. Uh, so let's talk about the pieces of the application, right? The things that you absolutely have to have for your application to show is uh, complete on our end. Uh, so this entire process happens online through LSAC. Uh, if you are here uh, and having and a part of this conversation and are unaware of who LSAC is, I would encourage you to check out their website. It is lsac.org. Uh, they are the uh, mothership of the law school admissions process. Uh, and so everything that you do uh, in terms of applying to law school will happen through them. Uh, so uh, all of the materials will be submitted through them, the entire kit and caboodle. So make you familiarize yourself with them. Uh, of course, we will need a personal statement. Uh, it's two pages at least. Uh, I think that probably three or four is a good number to stop at, right? Uh, don't feel obligated to write a five or six page personal statement. Most people do what they need to do in two pages, uh, but I've seen some three or four page personal statements that were wonderful personal statements. So I think that as long as you have at least two, uh, maybe no more than three or four, you're probably in a good place with us at Wayne. Uh, so don't do any weird stuff with the margins, right? Traditional font size, 12 or 11 or 12 traditional fonts. No need to do anything fancy with, uh, you know, the alignment of the margins. Uh, and just a note, right? I was just having a conversation with a pre-law advisor earlier today about this. Uh, I think that there's a lot of emphasis placed on what do I write about? Uh, and I think that matters, right? I think that, you know, overall, what you want to communicate in a personal statement is who you are and why you're here, right? So who are you as a person and why are you at this stage of this journey, right? Why are you considering taking this next uh, academic and professional step? Uh, and I think if you can convey that message, uh, then it's a strong personal statement, right? Uh, but I think that what makes the personal statements the best is if they're well written. Uh, I can't say enough about how important it is for grammar, spelling, punctuation, right? All of these little pieces uh, that matter in the process to be tight. Uh, so when you write that personal statement, make sure you're circulating it to people whose eyes you trust, you know, who can give you some feedback on that structure, right? On the, the, the details, right? And not necessarily the content. So uh, make sure you're thinking about that and circulating your personal statement to folks who you trust, who can give you that feedback to make sure you're not missing something uh, that could be an easy way for somebody to question the strength of your writing. Uh, because the personal statement is fundamentally you know, the institution's introduction to you as a writer uh, and lawyers are above all else professional writers. So that part of who you are is also being evaluated at that early stage of the process on the, in the admission cycle. So uh, be thoughtful about that. Uh, and I think you'll be satisfied. We talked about the resume, uh, letters of recommendation, for Wayne, at least two, uh, but no more than four. Uh, if you are two years or less removed from completing your undergraduate degree at the time that you apply, 
know, at least one of your letters of recommendation has to come from somebody that's taught you in a classroom. Uh, that shows up in different ways, right? Uh, professors are usually good resources for that. Some people will have, you know, uh, grad students that taught them, right? And we've seen those. Uh, but somebody that's had you in the classroom and can vouch for your ability to be a student and how you show up. Uh, the other letter can be from somebody, anybody who is willing to vouch for your candidacy uh, as an applicant. My advice to students is when they're having the conversation about letters of recommendation, uh, that the way they frame it uh, is to ask for a strong letter of recommendation. Uh, one, because uh, it signals the seriousness of what you're asking for. Uh, and two, because it gives people who may not be able to do that an out, right? If they can't write you a strong letter of recommendation, then you got to move on to another person who most certainly can, right? Uh, so be thoughtful about that uh, and who you ask because that matters. Uh, the addenda, if any of them apply to you, uh, submitting those as well. Uh, and then we'll also get through this process something called a Credential Assembly Service Report. Uh, that is something compiled by LSAC, uh, which includes all of your LSAT scores and then undergraduate GPA and transcripts uh, and then your graduate level, any classes, any schooling that you've done beyond uh, your uh, high school years, right? We need to see those transcripts. So even if you've done a graduate program, although we do not use your graduate GPA to make the decision, we still want to see those transcripts. Uh, but the Credential Assembly Service Report will compile for us based on your undergraduate transcripts and grades, a GPA that we use primarily in the admissions process to make uh, that decision on uh, your academic acumen and ability to succeed uh, academically in our program. So we need that as well. Uh, just some advice, right, as you're thinking about this application process and the timeline itself, I uh, always encourage students to apply early. Uh, and I actually had somebody who's considering law school ask me, well, what, what exactly does that mean, right? What does early look like uh, in this process? And so, you know, for Wayne, we don't start communicating admissions decisions until January, right? Uh, and so my advice to students when I suggest applying early uh, I always frame it as you want to have your application materials in, I would say, before the holidays, right? If you want to feel your, if you want to be able to say, yes, I successfully applied early and I'm in a position to be one of the first to know what my status is with Wayne Law. I think having your materials in, I would say, before Thanksgiving or, in the, or at least before Christmas, right? Now, you'll put yourself in a position where you'll know earlier in the process where you stand with us, whether it's admitted or waitlisted or, or we aren't in a position uh, to, to render favorably on your file, you'll know that as well. Um, the other piece of this is to own the parts of this you can control, right? Uh, there are things about this process that you are absolutely in control of and then there are things in this process that you are not. Um, you know, your undergraduate GPA, that cake is baked. You can't go back and make that be any different. Um, you know, to an extent, you know, the, the LSAT, if you've taken it and you've given it everything you got, you can't go back and make that score be different. So influence the places where you can, right? Your personal statement, right? That's a good place to be able to really show, you know, who you are and what you're about, um, you know, and be able to tell your story, right? Uh, and then the, the timeliness of the application, the completeness of the application, making sure that there, you know, aren't any weird errors in the application that uh, will cause you some problems later in the process, right? Uh, and I think all of that sort of fits into this third bullet, which is to be thorough, be thoughtful, and be the best you. Uh, the application itself is, is a step into a professional space. Uh, and so everything about the application and the process should be professional. Uh, so again, that's where I encourage you to be thorough, be thoughtful, and be the best you. Uh, that will apply in practice too, right? You, <laughs> when you become a lawyer, you're going to want to be those things. Uh, and so that, that work starts now. Uh, the last point that I want to share, at least on this front, uh, if you have not planned anything before, uh, this is the time to do that. Uh, plan this part of the process. Uh, be, be thoughtful in the steps that you take. Uh, if you are, you know, a, a, a junior, right, or a sophomore, and you're just thinking about this, uh, this is the time to plot out your steps and really figure out what you want to do and how you're going to get there, right? Uh, so be thoughtful about it and be meticulous in that planning. All right, so let's talk money, right? Uh, so application process costs and hacks. Uh, most schools charge some form of application fee or a good number of schools do. Lucky for you all, Wayne does not. So we do not charge an application fee for the pleasure of applying to us. 
Uh, but here's where the real fun starts. Uh, so LSAC uh, for that Credential Assembly Service Report, uh, they charge you for the privilege of having them do that work for you, right? Uh, so you sign up for their Credential Assembly Service uh, and that is a cost. Uh, and then you sign up to have your Credential Assembly Service Report sent to the schools that you want, to, want them sent to. And that is a cost. So for every school that you want to send that report to, you have to pay them to send that report. And I believe it's roughly 45 bucks for that. I think it's 165 for uh, the Credential Assembly Service um, so that those costs can start to add up quickly. Uh, there's also the seat deposit. Uh, so if we do render favorably on your file and are able to extend you an offer of admission, uh, for us to know for sure that you're coming uh, and to signal that commitment to us, uh, we will ask from you a, uh, a seat deposit. Uh, they're typically broken into two parts, right? So typically one is due in April and then another is due a little later in the summer. Uh, and the total cost of that seat deposit is $500. The good news uh, is that that cost goes toward uh, your fall tuition cost, so it's not just money that's out there without a purpose or, or uh, a reason, right? That money does go towards your education, but it just signals to us as an institution your level of seriousness and commitment uh, to joining us uh, in the fall as a part of that incoming class. Now, uh, some of the things like the hacks, right? You know, I guess more or less we're getting around those costs for the schools that do charge a fee. Uh, you should be requesting fee waivers, right? So for every school that you apply to every time, make sure that you're requesting a fee waiver and making and understanding what it would take for you to get one uh, so that you can reduce that cost on the front end. Uh, LSAC also has a fee waiver program that I think is pretty cool and more students should try to take advantage of. Uh, so there's a link there that will uh, take you to their page on the subject. Uh, the last time I checked what you got for that uh, fee waiver was two LSATs right, uh, uh, one instance of the LSAT writing uh, function because they've separated that out. So if you don't know that now, uh, I guess this is as good a time any to break the news to you. Uh, so the L LSAT used to have the writing portion happen during the exam, they've broken that out uh, and it can happen separate from the exam. A thing to be conscious of uh, if you don't do it timely is that schools will not get uh, your Credential Assembly Service Report until they have that LSAT writing sample in. So make sure you do that timely and follow the rules LSAC uh, has laid out for that. Uh, and then what you also get with that uh, fee waiver is uh, that Credential Assembly Service uh, registration, right? So what we talked about, what you have to pay for with LSAC to have them do the work of compiling your credentials. Uh, this uh, fee waiver will cover that cost as well. Uh, the letter of recommendation piece is included in that. So for your letters of recommendation, uh, you won't send us letters directly. You will communicate to LSAC, LSAC who your recommenders are, give them the contact info, and they will reach out to them and, and let them know, hey, you've been listed as a recommender, please submit your letter to us, right? Uh, and so you'll get that as included in that uh, package. Uh, I think one of the, what the real value here is that you get six Credential Assembly Service Law School Report. So that CAS report that I talked about is we've got to pay 45 bucks to have each one of those sent out. Uh, you get the six of those included so you can essentially apply to six law schools uh, at the only cost being the, the cost of whatever their application is. Um, so there's something to think about. Uh, if you do get denied on that uh, fee waiver the first time, I always encourage people to follow their appeals process just so that you can uh, make sure that you've exhausted all your options. It's a need-based uh, fee waiver process, right? So you do have to demonstrate uh, financial need for them to be able to grant that to you. But it's a wonderful resource and tool for you and something definitely to consider. All right, so paying for law school. Uh, so at Wayne, uh, our sort of regime for paying for law school sort of falls in the couple of buckets, right? There is uh, the front end of this process and the application process. Our scholarship program uh, is merit-based, right? So it's based primarily on uh, what you've accomplished in undergrad, right? So your performance in undergrad, your GPA, uh, and then your performance on the LSAT. Uh, for those students who uh, bring both medians, right? So for this year, if you've got a 365 and a 160, right, or a 365 or better and a 160, uh, you'd be in a really competitive position for a strong and lucrative uh, 
a scholarship offer at the time that you're admitted, right? Uh, we take into consideration the wholeness of the person, uh, but the factors that carry the weight in those scholarship decisions on that front end uh, is uh, rooted primarily in your performance in undergrad and your performance on the LSAT. So there's that piece of it. Now there's also the Damon J. Keith Scholarship Program, a wonderful opportunity for students who meet the criteria of that program uh, to be awarded a scholarship and amounts up to full tuition uh, if we admit them to the law school. You know, so students who typically satisfy that criteria uh, have attended uh, Detroit public schools, right, graduated from DPS schools, or attended school in the city of Detroit, either public or private, uh, so long as they lived in, the, or private or parochial rather, so long as they lived in the city uh, while they were attending that school. Uh, or if you uh, attended an HBCU, an HSI, tribal college or university, uh, then you would be eligible for that scholarship. There isn't a second step, right? So you don't have to write a paper or do anything like that. Uh, all you have to do is submit an application uh, and uh, fit those criteria. Uh, and we will notice, notice that and review you uh, as we would normally, right, for that scholar for admission. Uh, and if we admit you, uh, you would be eligible for that scholarship and amounts up to full tuition. Uh, the other spoke on the wheel, right, as it were, for students who are attending Wayne Law is federal financial aid, right, so loan dollars. Uh, you can work with our financial aid office to figure out uh, how, to, how to access those. Of course, you'll have to fill out the FAFSA, right? Uh, if, so if you aren't familiar uh, with FAFSA, uh, it's something to get familiar with as a part of your law school experience. Uh, but most of our students, again, are in the building on a combination of scholars, merit scholarship dollars uh, and federal financial aid. Uh, we do have some smaller sort of in-house bespoke scholarship opportunities, uh, but those are usually for matriculated students and they are much smaller dollar amounts uh, uh, throughout, the, throughout your, the time that you're in law school that can be a little bit more narrowly tailored, right? You may have to write a paper, you may have to demonstrate interest in the area, uh, that whoever the donor was indicated was important for this. Uh, but it's just another thing, uh, another way to help offset some of the costs of your legal education. And you'll learn more about that uh, if you're admitted and do matriculate to Wayne. So there's that piece of it, at least in terms of paying for law school. Uh, so uh, I think this feels like a good time to transition to the Q&A portion of uh, this wonderful evening that we have here. So I'm gonna close my sharing screen here and then get into what we've got in our Q&A box in our chat. Uh, so Ryan Nisker is asking about accessibility of professors uh, and then uh, can he send in his application during the semester he graduates for the upcoming fall semester? Uh, and then he's uh, interested in clinics surrounding employment law, if there are any clinics uh, for those who've been wrongfully terminated um, so I, I guess I'll start with the first question, uh, professor accessibility, right, I think is a huge tentpole of what we do. Uh, our faculty pride themselves on being accessible uh, and legitimately interested in the, in the careers and outcomes and lives of our students. So I think you'll be more than satisfied with who our professors are and how accessible you will find them to be uh, during your time at Wayne if you do matriculate as a student. Uh, and then can I send my application to Wayne Law during the semester I graduate uh, for the upcoming fall 2021 semester? Uh, you can absolutely submit an application in May. Uh, one thing that I uh, left out in the, the, I guess the timeline piece is our priority scholarship deadline, right? And so that deadline exists to encourage students to get their materials in sooner so that they can get fullest consideration uh, for scholarships along with their admission, right? Uh, and that, date is March 15th. Uh, so if you so you are best positioned for both admission and scholarship so long as your application materials are in uh, by March 15th. You can submit those materials after that date but at that point you're a, a little more beholden to uh, market pressure so whatever we have left in the coffers at the time that you apply is what you'd be considered for and so you could be somebody who if they applied earlier would be eligible for maybe a full tuition scholarship and maybe we aren't in a position to offer that as you apply later in the process. So it's just something to think about uh, as you're trying to time uh, the nature of your application, uh, Ryan, and to others who are thinking and, and asking similar questions. Uh, and so the, the last piece here, your third question about uh, the, the employment law space, 
Uh, I think the best option for, for, for you in that would probably be the disability law clinic. Um, they, do, they do a lot of really interesting and, and impactful work. Uh, I don't know if all of it's gonna revolve around employment law, uh, but it may touch on some areas that are important to you that'll still ring that bell and hit that button for you. So there's that piece. Uh, so I'm gonna scroll down here. All right, so are there any, are there any programs related to health law? Uh, and see a real need for this specialty or is there something closely related to health law? Uh, and I think it's sort of an emerging space for us, right, Dr. Donna? Uh, one of our faculty members, uh, Professor Lance Gable, is, uh, he's got his MPH and he's, uh, he thinks a lot about health law and is, in, is sort of our in-house expert in that space. Uh, and so I think you'll have some courses that you can take that'll touch on the issues that matter to you. Uh, and there are more and more sort of interesting career opportunities related to that that pop up. Uh, so staying in communication and connection with our career and professional development office uh, on that subject, I think uh, will also help you hit on those buttons. But between the courses and the different kinds of things that you will be able to do as a student, I think you'll touch on uh, that health law space and what your options may be. Uh, and then the next question is what plans does Wayne Law have for if COVID is still around next fall? Uh, if COVID is around next fall, then I'm presuming uh, the, that we will probably continue on in a space where we'll be teaching virtually. Um, you know, and it, to be honest, I think that, you know, we're operating under the presumption that things are not necessarily going to be exactly the same, but if they are, uh, we'll continue to build out that plan and address that uh, as we sort of come to it. Uh, any recommendations to achieving a 160? Any insight on the grants and scholarships? Any additional information on letters of recommendation? Uh, is applying to take after taking the January LSAT too late to start? And are we are we able to send you a copy of the application process with deadlines? Uh, so for the first question, recommendations on achieving a minimum of the 160. Uh, I mean, it, it's not as simple as me, you know, sort of suggesting, hey, if you do this, you'll get a 160. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Uh, I think that if you're thinking about preparing for the LSAT, uh, I think the three things that you want to think about most, most importantly are one, how much time do you have to dedicate to preparation? Uh, how much money do you have to de dedicate to preparation? And how do you best learn, right? I think if you, you know, really evaluate those things and then look at the universe of options that you have as it relates to prep, uh, then you'll start to build out a plan that will help you maximize your performance on test day. Uh, you know, I, I'm always hesitant to tell people exact numbers because, you know, I think what it does is it gives people a complex about performance. And I think that the thing that you want to do with the LSAT is maximize your own performance on test day so that you can feel good about whatever that number is because you know you gave it your best shot, right? Uh, not everybody's going to get a 160 on the LSAT. I, mean, I think the national average is like the mid-150s. So most people, right, are, are at that, you know, mid-150s mark. Uh, and not hitting a 160 doesn't mean you aren't smart or brilliant, right? It doesn't mean you aren't good, right? It just means that on that day, uh, your test performance was not as strong as some of your peers. Uh, so I think the most important thing to focus on uh, is, you know, figuring out what your budget is, how much time you have to give to preparation, and then building out a preparation regime uh, that speaks to the way that you learn uh, and gets you into those opportunities. Uh, we talked a little bit about the grants, uh, the scholarship piece for us as an institution. As far as grants, we don't offer any grants. There may be some that are out there for you as a professional student, but I think those can be a little bit harder to find in the professional law space, right, or in the professional student space. So, you know, I think the goal, right, is to, to make the best case for yourself so that you can uh, achieve or, or acquire, right, that merit-based scholarship on the front end uh, to offset the costs. Uh, but beyond that, right, I think you've got to get creative uh, in terms of finding the opportunities uh, that, to help offset the costs that don't come from your institution specifically. Uh, as far as additional information on letters of recommendation, uh, if you've been out of college for, you know, over five years, I mean, I think the biggest thing is to just find the people who are willing to vouch for you, uh, who, who are in a position to write you that strong letter of recommendation. Uh, those could be uh, supervisors, they could be coworkers, they could be friends, mentors, right? Whoever wants to stand in the gap and say that, hey, Courtney's a great student, a great person, and I believe that they should uh, be in a, they're in a great position to take that next step. Uh, is applying after taking the January LSAT too late to start in the fall of 2021? Absolutely not. 
Uh, it will still put you in a position to have your materials submitted before that priority scholarship deadline. Uh, so you'd still be in a position to start in fall 2021 and uh, you know, still be in a good position to uh, be a part of the class. Uh, are we able to send a copy of the application process with deadlines? Uh, if that's something that you want to talk about and get a little bit more information about, you'll see our, uh, our contact info at the end. We can set up some time to chat and I'll answer any questions that you have. All right, so uh, Haley's wondering if we, if we retake the LSAT, do we have to also redo the writing? Uh, and then can admissions see both scores or just our most recent? Uh, I do believe that you may have to redo the writing. I'm not 100% sure on that. That's a little bit more of an LSAT, LSAC question. Um, but I'm fairly confident that if you retake the LSAT that uh, you, you may have the opportunity to, uh, to redo the writing piece as well. Uh, and then can admission see both scores or just the most recent? Yes, we can see both of those scores. No, we do not average them. Uh, we use the highest score to make our decision. Uh, and then are there any repercussions for retaking the LSAT uh, and achieving the same or a lower score? Uh, so uh, if you are, if you retake the LSAT uh, and your score goes down, again, we're using the highest score to make the decision. Uh, it just sort of puts a question mark out there in folks' minds about which one is the truer representation of you. Uh, if your score is the same, then we just presume that that's the score that you, you're going to get, right? Uh, it doesn't hurt you. It just is the score that you've achieved. Um, so there's that piece. Uh, Charlize uh, Smith has asked, if you've attained a master's, do they consider those transcripts and scholarship determination? Um, so the answer to that is no. Uh, so if we, if you have a graduate degree uh, and you were a rock star in grad school, but your undergraduate grades weren't necessarily the best, um, that's not the, the graduate degree may help in the story of where you are as a student right now. It may help us say, all right, well, we believe they're probably a little closer to being the, the student that they were the last two years of undergrad plus their masters than they were, you know, maybe in the first two years of undergrad where they weren't a rock star. Uh, but we aren't in a position to use those to help make scholarship decisions. Uh, Emma's taking the LSAT in November. Uh, and if she has to retake in January, can she submit an, at her application to us and explain that she's retaking? And will Wayne consider the January score? All right. So, uh, this is a really good question, a great opportunity for me to sort of talk about this, uh, this thing specifically. Uh, so if when you submit your application, you uh, indicate to us or we see in the file that there is a planned LSAT date that's out further, right, that's scheduled out, we won't review the file until we get that score. So Emma, in your case, uh, if, you, if it shows in your file uh, that you are retaking, that you're taking the LSAT in January, you're registered to take it. We won't review the application unless you tell us otherwise, right? Uh, so you can uh, send us an email and say, please review my application with my current score, right? Uh, and we will review it with that current score, even if there is that date that's further out. But if you don't tell us, we won't review the file until we see uh, that that, that uh, LSAT that's got that further date has been taken uh, and we get that score. Uh, so how likely is it that an undergrad GPA under 3.65 to be offset by a high LSAT score. Uh, I don't know when I have a full benefit, right, of, a, of the entire application in front of me and a, uh, I guess my arms around what the application pool looks like. It will be difficult for me to say definitively, uh, but I think the answer to that is that a strong LSAT score uh, does help, you know, I think that in, in, either, in either direction, right? So if you've got mixed indicators, maybe you've got a really strong GPA, maybe you got a really strong LSAT and maybe the other, the other component isn't as strong, uh, it doesn't necessarily offset it, but it gives us, you know, something to work with and say, okay, well, this person's demonstrated that they've got the academic potential and the ability uh, by, you know, through a strong LSAT performance, right? Um, or they've got, you know, really strong grades, but maybe the LSAT wasn't their jam. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be admitted, uh, but it puts us in a position where we can at least have the conversation about your academic acumen uh, and how well you can perform based on what we see. Uh, are there any civil rights law programs at Wayne State? Uh, so there is the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights. Uh, that's a, a huge part of what we do as an institution. Uh, it's literally a, a, the, a part of our law school, right? Uh, and there are a good number of courses related to that uh, that sort of fall under that umbrella, right, that you can take that'll help round out your, your education and your experience. So uh, there are absolutely some courses in that space. 
uh, that you can take. And I think you'll be satisfied with that experience. And again, I mean, when you talk about a clinical program, I think clinics are civil rights, right? I mean, it, it's, it's about, the, about helping people, right? And I think you can get a lot of the fix that you need on helping people really try to, uh, you know, get the service and support that they need, especially in a city like Detroit, um, you know, by participating in our clinical program and helping people get the, the support and access that they need. Uh, as that is obviously an infant changing table behind you, how welcoming is Wayne State for parents, either during COVID-19 or afterward? Uh, I think it's a fantastic place to be a parent, right? I mean, it, it's, you know, obviously as a father of three-year-old twins, right? I think that, you know, it's, it's uh, really important that, you know, you, you work at a place or you go to a place where you can be a parent. Uh, and I think having a part-time evening program, right, helps with that. I think that the, the combined day evening program helps with that because you'll find, you know, full-time parents doing that, right? You know, hey, I'm a full-time parent and a full-time worker. I need a, a schedule that's a little bit more flexible or, you know, I need to only do this when my schedule allows for it. So I think you'll find that that's absolutely a part of it. Uh, and that's a big piece of, of how we make sure that our, our uh, students who are parents uh, thrive in our space. And so what would a part-time law student's typical schedule look like? That's a great question. Uh, so typically what you will see uh, is courses that show up after that five o'clock, right? People getting out of work hour. So you'll have a couple of courses a week in the evening after work hours uh, that you will take to complete your uh, coursework per semester. And again, you'll do that, uh, you know, until you get to the end of your degree, which for most people, again, happens in, uh, we'll say four or four and a half years. So it's evening courses after work hours, a couple of courses is a week uh, that you will take to satisfy the program and, and work towards graduation. Uh, are internships required? And so if would a career working as an administrator in a court satisfy that requirement? Uh, yes, yeah, so there is a uh, experiential learning requirement uh, where you will have to complete uh, either an externship or participate in our clinical program uh, up to six credit hours, I believe is the number. You'll have to do at least six credit hours worth of that to graduate. Uh, and a pre-existing or, or work that you've already done uh, that you've already done uh, would not satisfy that. Uh, so you'd have to start and do something different in law school. Or if you continue to work at a place, right, uh, you could try to see if you could do it as an externship and give up the money, right? But whatever. You know, but you'd have to do it in a way that uh, that you get classroom credit for. Uh, is the application for for dual degree law program separate from the law school application? Can I be accepted as a JD candidate or not the dual degree program? A uh, great question about the dual degree option. So uh, you apply to the second program separate from the JD program. So yes, you can absolutely uh, be accepted as a JD candidate uh, and not be accepted to the other program. Uh, typically what happens is students start as law students and sometime in that first or even the second year, they apply to that second program uh, with the hope of matriculating to that program and getting that dual degree. Uh, so you, there is room for you to be accepted as a JD candidate and not uh, as a dual degree candidate. Uh, I'm interested in criminal law. Does Wayne Law have a great criminal law program concentration? Could you speak on the aspects of that? Uh, so great question. So we absolutely have uh, criminal law courses that you can take, right? Uh, An expertise in that space that I think you will find uh, alluring, right? You know, I think that if a criminal law is a space that you want to go into, it'll be about the combination of, uh, you know, I think the courses that you'll take and then the experiences that you'll have outside the classroom uh, that will really put you in a position uh, to satisfy that and really, and really dig deep on it. And I think that'll come through externship opportunities, even some clinical stuff, right? Uh, I think the post-conviction advocacy clinic will probably be something that you'll find some interest in, right? Um, in terms of that criminal law space. And so that's another great tool uh, for you to really scratch that itch, right, as, as it were uh, in the criminal law space. But you've got the courses and you'll have everything you need uh, to get out there and be a great criminal lawyer. Uh, if you're taking the first LSAT in January, uh, but you can submit all the material before the holidays, will the application still be reviewed? Uh, no, so, the, so in order for us to review the application, we've got to have your LSAT score. Uh, you can submit every other piece of the application uh, but we will not review the application until we have your LSAT score in hand. Uh, so you can submit all of those pieces if you like. But again, we won't review the application until we have an LSAT. I'm interested in family law. What does Wayne offer for those wanting to pursue that career path? 
Uh, so uh, the Free Legal Aid Clinic, I think, is a space where you can get into some of that family law work if that's something that you're uh, interested in or curious about. And as always, again, the classroom experience. I think externships are also a good opportunity to uh, sort of satisfy that. So seeking placements and, and agencies and bodies, right, that do the work in the family law space. And again, collaborating with our Career and Professional Development Office, declaring that your interest, right? They will work with you to help you find the experiences that will matter to you. And then taking the courses, right? So some of this is about the classroom space uh, and taking courses that are, that are aligned with that. And of course, we absolutely have the course offerings uh, to satisfy that. But I think the real magic happens when you go out there and do what lawyers do uh, in that experiential learning space. Uh, so Kayla is interested in completing a dual degree program and is currently entering the second year of the MBA. Um, so I think that generally speaking, Kayla, right, the preference is for you to start the, in the JD program, right, and then go over to the MBA program. I would encourage you to talk to your MBA advisors, right, to talk to them a little bit more about what a path back to the law school might look like. Um, because generally speaking, right, the students who go this route typically start in law school and then uh, attach the MBA to it as opposed to uh, the other way around. I think it's possible, right? And I think it could work, but with two years uh, of your MBA program essentially done, I just don't know how much more real estate is left uh, for you to be able to do uh, sort of both of those things as one degree. I mean, I don't know how long uh, you have until you're done with the, the MBA, um, you know, but it, you could still reasonably, right, finish the MBA, maybe you finish the MBA before you start law school, it's not a thing, but I think it's a conversation to have with uh, your MBA advisors about, you know, sort of what's left for you to take, uh, and how much of that would be satisfactory to the law school if you wanted to do the dual degree option, uh, but you're always free to apply to the law school and join us as a part of the program. Uh, Jeff is curious, roughly speaking, what percentage of your incoming class tends to be from Michigan, the great bulk of it, I think is the answer, right? Most of our students uh, are, you know, from Michigan, from the region, right, from the state. Um, but we do get students from out of state who tend to join, who join us as well. Uh, what advice would you give to a candidate who has a strong background in community service, a low GPA, and a 150 LSAT score? Uh, my advice to that student would be uh, to go forth courageously, right? Uh, the only way you know where you stand with the law school is to apply. Uh, I would encourage you to apply early, right? Uh, and, and, you know, sort of understand that the journey for you may not necessarily be a straight line. Uh, knowing that our median LSAT's a 160 and a 150 doesn't quite get there, uh, that the answer could be no, right? Or that the answer could be not right now, right? You could be waitlisted and, you know, we still find you compelling and you just have to wait. Um, so uh, I would encourage you to apply, right? Give it a shot and let us make that decision. Uh, but also understand that as a result of, you know, sort of where things are, that the answer may not be favorable. Uh, are there clinics or other educational experiences specifically for intellectual property? Uh, so uh, we used to have a patent procurement clinic. I'm not sure if that exists anymore. I think that uh, that may have changed. But uh, of course, there are classroom offerings um, that are out there that relate to intellectual property. Uh, in that space. Uh, I think the corporate counsel externship may give you some room to touch on that depending on where you're placed and the kind of work that you want to do. Uh, I think that if you're looking for that kind of stuff, again, I, uh, you know, portions of that are going to come from uh, working, you know, with our career professional development office to get those job experiences that will allow you to touch on that. Uh, I think the transactional law competition may touch on some of that too. Uh, but I think the great, the great bulk of that is probably going to come in the classroom space and in a, uh, looking at uh, what you can do outside the classroom in terms of uh, jobs and, and, and internship and externship experiences. So, uh, all right, so we have hit seven o'clock. I try to honor the time that we set for ourselves. Um, I'm going to pop back on my uh, quick, uh, share my screen really quickly here so that you all can see our contact info. Uh, so this is us, uh, Wayne State Law. You can reach us at 313-577-3937 if you have questions. Uh, lawinquire at wayne.edu is the email address. Uh, our Dean of Admissions, Kathy Fox. There's me, the Associate Director of Admissions, my wonderful colleague, Jill Burnett Maurice, who's our Graduate Outreach Specialist and is a Wayne Law graduate, 2017. Uh, Caitlin York, who's our recruiter, uh, the 2020 Wayne Law grad, 
Uh, and our student ambassadors, Sim Lauren and Christina, who if you call or email are probably the first people you'll interact with. Uh, I do want to thank my, uh, my uh, magicians behind the curtain, uh, Kaylee Place and, and Mary Hiller in our communications office, and of course, Jill Burnett Maurice, uh, who manned uh, that Q&A pod for me. Uh, we look forward to continuing to have you all be a part of future sessions. Join us here, same, same Wayne Law time, same Wayne Law channel next week for uh, a session on the personal statement. Uh, thank you all for joining us and, and have a great evening.